to understand the situation in the rear of the first and fourth Ukrainian fronts, with access to western Ukraine and the Carpathian region, it is necessary to refer to the documents. Here is what is said in the report of the command of the troops to protect the rear of the first Ukrainian front service operational and combat activity of the troops took place in a new, but more complicated situation. The new situation consisted in the fact that due to the successful advance of the Red Army to the west and the liberation from German occupation of the regions of western Ukraine, our troops faced a developed bandit network Ukrainian German nationalists. Thus, our troops, along with the fulfillment of the main task of protecting the rear of the front, had to conduct significant combat operations to eliminate large and small gangs operating both near and at a remote distance from the front. The document noted that in the liquidation of gangs border guards met with many difficulties. The bandits used nefarious terrorist techniques and sophisticated methods of struggle developed by nationalist centres long before the arrival of the Red Army. The gangs also had defensive structures, trenches, dugouts, dugouts, communication lines in forests, ravines and in some settlements, with a stock of food and ammunition, which was replenished at the expense of the local population both voluntarily and by robbing them, as well as when attacking units and convoys of the Red Army. During the years of Nazi occupation, the population of the western regions of Ukraine was subjected to intensive treatment both by Hitlerites and nationalists. Some people succumbed to hostile propaganda and were drawn into gangs. Often relatives and acquaintances of the bandits provided them with assistance. They informed them about the events held by the party and Soviet activists, informed them about the location of small units and garrisons of the Red Army, did not support the struggle with these gangs. The political workers of the frontier troops, party and Soviet bodies had the task to explain to the local population of the liberated areas all the counter-revolutionary nature of the programme and actions of the Ukrainian nationalists as the most inveterate enemies of the Ukrainian people, while as direct agents and proxies of the German fascist invaders. It was necessary to help the population to understand the internal and external policy of the Communist Party and the Soviet government during the war, to tell people about the heroism and self-sacrifice of the Red Army soldiers at the front and of the Soviet people at the rear, to mobilise the inhabitants of these areas to actively assist our troops in carrying out service and operational activities and combat operations. We began this work as early as in Sniatin and Sniatin district, but conversations alone could not be limited. Bandits intensified their activities, especially in Vashkiv, Putilov, Kitsman, Kavam and some other districts. In Vizhnitsa district, they completely destroyed telephone communication, cut down poles, destroyed a strategically important bridge over the river Cheramosh. In Vizhnitsa itself, they burned three stores with goods and warehouses with timber stocks at the sawmill and plywood factory. In the village of Biaragomet, they destroyed the state farm and massacred the family of the chairman of the village council, who was in the Red Army. In another place, they killed the chairman of the collective farm, three fighters of the extermination battalion, a watchman of the village council, and a woman. The bandits attacked individual fighters and small groups of Red Army soldiers, cars and wagons with ammunition and food that had fallen behind the columns. Once they even seized a jammed 45mm gun of one of the artillery units of the 9th Red Banner Plastune Division and engaged in open combat with another unit of this division. For me it was not the first acquaintance with the organisation of Ukrainian nationalists, as well as for those who served in these places before the war. And this criminal organisation itself had a long pedigree. It was created back in 1929, with its centre in Berlin. One of the organisers of the AUN and its first leader was E. Konovalets, a colonel of the Petyar army, an Austrian subject who served in the Austro-German army. He distinguished himself with special cruelty in suppressing the revolutionary uprising of workers in Kiev in 1918. Then Konovalets did not please the fascists, who began active preparations for an attack on the Soviet Union, and was killed by them. In 1938, another former colonel of the Petlyar army and an agent of German intelligence, A. Melik, nicknamed Consul One, became the head of the AUN. In 1940 there was a split in the organisation. As a result, the AUN split into the Melnikovites, led by Melnik, and the Banderates, led by Bandera. 
Both of these groups faithfully carried out the tasks of Hitler's intelligence to organize terrorist, sabotage and espionage against the USSR. At the end of 1939, being an assistant to the head of the outpost, in one of the border villages I met a Polish girl who worked in the local school as a cleaner. She told me about the difficult, joyless life under the Polish bourgeois government and confessed that she had seen a movie for the first time when the Red Army came to their village. I asked her if she read newspapers and books. The girl said that she read her teacher's books, he had a lot of books, and not only Russian, but also Ukrainian. There are even some for which the Polish authorities persecuted. That's very interesting, I remarked. Can't you at least look at them? The teacher is unlikely to give them to me. And you, comrade lieutenant, come to our school. I reported my conversation to the chief of the outpost, Senior Lieutenant Koval, and the next day I went to the school. My acquaintance was finishing cleaning the classrooms. She took me to the other half of the building. Here I live, she said. And here, mister, teacher. She opened the door. Come in, comrade lieutenant, mister. Teacher is not at home. The wine went to the district, and I was ordered to clean his apartment. The girl opened the bookcase. Here are those books. Among school textbooks and volumes of Russian literature, there were books in Ukrainian Taras Shevchenko, Lesya Ukrainka, Ivan Franko. Between them stood a thick, well-bound history of self-styled Ukraine and various other nationalist literature. The girl handed me the history of self-styled Ukraine from the first pages of this catechism I saw portraits of the ideological inspirers of Ukrainian nationalism, Konovalets, Melnik Bandera, as well as its defenders Batka Makno, Skoropadsky, and other figures of various sorts. The section armed forces described the organizational structure, military ranks of the command staff. There were even colorful illustrations of the uniforms of nationalist formations. In the first months of our stay in Prykarpatia, we did not pay much attention to such literature. We thought that the Ukrainians who lived for a long time under the heel of the Polish bourgeoisie and were subjected to cruel exploitation, created these organizations as a response to arbitrary rule. But life showed that the Ukrainian nationalists, whose activities were financed and directed by imperialist forces, first of all by German fascism, developed active subversive activities against the Soviet state. As it turned out, the school teacher turned out to be a sub-district guide of the Aun, ideologically treating the population. At the beginning of February 1940, we had to get acquainted with other activities of this bandit organization. The regional department of the NKVD together with the command of the 94th Border Guard Detachment, conducted a number of Czechist military operations to seize underground weapons and ammunition depots and detain out illegal immigrants. With a platoon of border guards, I took part in such an operation in the Stryje district. In the course of the operation, Colonel D. Medvedev, head of the NKVD of Drohobic region, who during the Great Patriotic War became the commander of a famous partisan detachment in Rovenshina, was wounded. The legendary Soviet scout N. Kuznetsov also acted in this detachment. Although the Aun called itself a political organization, in fact, it was a gang of spies, saboteurs, robbers, and murderers. Even before the German attack on our country, the Aun, relying on its agents in the western regions of Ukraine, created a wide network of underground district and bush organizations headed by the so called district wires bodies that directly led the bandit formations in the field. These organizations carried out subversive activities against Soviet power and the state interests of the USSR. I will give an excerpt from only one document of that time, placed in the collection of materials on the activities of border troops in the pre-war years. The main support of German intelligence in its activities is the AUN, which under the direct influence and guidance of the Gestapo actively conducts its counter-revolutionary anti-Soviet activities and supplies a cadre of spies, saboteurs and terrorists. During the whole of 1940, it, especially the second half of the year, the Gestapo and the Aun's foreign wire, located in Krakow, carried out intensive activities through their emissaries and agents sent to our territory, aimed at activating the remaining Aun organizations in the western regions, establishing and creating links, and obtaining intelligence, conducting counter-revolutionary agitation. With the first shots on the Soviet border, this so-called political organization began to kill party and Soviet workers, 
individual citizens, smash communication centers, shoot from attics and basements, from forests and ravines in the back of Red Army fighters and commanders. During the years of occupation, the Banderites fought with partisans, caught and killed our spies, handed them over to the Gestapo, committed acts of sabotage in the rear of the Red Army, conducted espionage in favor of the Nazis. In 1943, Additional nationalist armed gangs were created on the territory of Soviet Ukraine, called Ukrainian Insurgent Army. These gangs committed terrorist acts against the workers of Ukraine to please Hitler's occupiers. The leaders of the UPA were first Klauchkovsky, nicknamed Klim Sever, and then a member of the Central Wire of the Anshukevik. With the liberation of the western regions of Ukraine from the Nazi invaders, many UPA members fled to the west. The remaining part of the gangs went underground and continued to commit terrorist and sabotage acts against our troops and party and Soviet activists, trying with all their might to prevent the restoration of Soviet power and the advance of the Red Army. The Aun became most active from the moment of the announcement of conscription into the Red Army of citizens of the liberated western regions of Ukraine in early August 1944. Therefore, the head of the rear guard troops of the 4th Ukrainian Front had to leave one battalion each to protect the rear of the 18th and 38th armies, and the rest of the forces were to be concentrated to destroy the Upa gangs. The 92nd Frontier Regiment was brought to the town of Nadvornaya. Our battalion arrived there. Lieutenants Palagin, Lobanov, Ozonoye, Chaika, Zastrozhin, Tikachenko, together with Captain Vasilchenko, began to collect information about the gangs. Soon it was possible to detain two liaisons who went with a report from the district wire to the village one. The report said, A frontier regiment arrived in Nadvornaya and settled in small units all over the city. Soldiers and commanders behave in the highest degree of vigilance. The service is carried out in such a way that it is impossible to pass from town to town. Each group has a radio station. What this regiment intends to do is still unknown and the intention was this regiment together with the Red Army units involved in the operation on the scale of the entire front to eliminate in the so-called Black Forest, 15 kilometers northeast of Stanislav, the center of bandit formations of the Aun. There were also received data that in addition to the Black Forest, the gang is operating in the area of the village of Gustav, acting as a kind of combat guard on the way to the center of the main formation. By order of the regimental headquarters, our battalion went to Gustav with the task of liquidating this gang. We were marching. At a halt, a young man in a shabby Red Army uniform with the Order of the Red Banner on his chest came up to us. On his right arm, he showed traces of a heavy wound. The young man told us that after being wounded at the front, he had been declared unfit for military service. After a short time, three armed men came to him and took him into the forest. The bandit leader said to him, You fought for the Soviets, so now you will teach our fighters the battle tactics of the Reds. I realized that I could get away from the bandits only by cunning. I agreed and went home to see my relatives. On the way I learned that border guards came to Nadvornaya, so I went there to inform them where the gang was hiding. According to a local resident we met, there was a school of junior commanders in the River Strii and its tributary Dube, about which we knew nothing. Should we believe the man who called himself a former Red Army soldier or not? The Red Army uniform and the order do not tell us everything. It was known that bandits changed entire units into Red Army uniforms. If it is not true, then the battalion will not come out in time to the starting line, and the operation to eliminate the gang near the village of Gustav, where other units of the regiment followed. And if the report is true, then in the rear we would have a bandit school, which could strike us in the back. Time didn't allow us to think long. At night you will take us to the swamps, I said. All right, he replied. The regiment commander was informed about the received data and was asked to cover the forest edge behind the river. It was a warm August night. Our voluntary assistant led us into the Plavni. We passed a village. A field of rye began. The battalion turned in a chain. Suddenly shots were heard on the left flank. Lieutenant Ivanov reported, I met the bandits' guard, fighting. Having covered the village with the platoon of machine guns of Lieutenant Mamukov, the rest of the units decided to cover the riverbeds on the right and left. 
The ring around the bandits was shrinking. They rushed to the river, but from across the river from the edge of the forest they were struck by the fighters of the manoeuvring group, who were providentially sent there by Colonel Blumen. The bandits rushed in different directions. Suddenly they came upon Lieutenant Mamukov's machine gunners. The situation here was serious. The bandits almost broke into the village. Mamukov was rescued by Lieutenant Ivanishchev's machine gunners and senior Lieutenant Okramchuk, who struck from the flanks and from the rear. The resistance of the nationalists was broken. Only somewhere in the centre of the Plavnia there were still single shots. Soon everything quieted down there too. We decided to make a control sweep. Lieutenant Burinov, communications officer Kirillov, and I on horseback moved behind the chain of fighters. We were approaching the riverbank, and then they reported that they found a general's uniform and a radio station. We hurried there. The fighters were holding a black SS uniform, on the sleeve of which we could see the inscription Governor General. A radio station was lying nearby. At that moment, Lieutenant Burinov shouted, Comrade Captain, look out. A big brute came up out of the bushes right at me. His hair was dishevelled, his eyes burning with hatred. He's aiming at me. I give the horse spurs and knock the bandit down. One of the men fires. The bandit falls on his back. Senior Lieutenant Glaviznin came up, looked at the general's uniform. Where's the owner? The owner hasn't been found yet, but the general's cap was found. Instead of the SS cockade a skull with cross bones, there was a trident, the symbol of Ukrainian nationalists. On the bank of the river we found nine corpses. Seven were lying in a row, and two at a distance. Seven had been shot in the back of the head, two in the temple. It looked like the command staff of the school had been shot, and some leaders had committed suicide. Died like scorpions die in a jar from the sting of other scorpions, someone said. One of those lying nearby was without a uniform, in a white silk shirt, and without a headdress. Several detainees were brought in. In the corpse, without uniform, they recognised the governor-general who had come to the school with an inspection. Neither his name nor his position were known to the detainees. They reported the results of the battle to the regimental headquarters and were instructed to send the body of the man to whom the uniform belonged, as well as the uniform itself and the general's cap under guard to the front headquarters to General Fedeev. The convoy group was led by Senior Lieutenant Gliviznin. The border guards returned the next morning. Well, I asked Gliviznin, did you recognise the Governor General? I don't know, answered my assistant. They said to go back, and who it is, and what they will figure it out. The bandit school was finished. Soon the same fate befell the gang hiding near the village of Gustov. In the report of the regiment's headquarters addressed to Major General Fadiev, the chief of the rear guard troops of the 4th Ukrainian Front, it was said. The forces of the 2nd and 3rd SBS and the man group during the operation near the village of Gustav destroyed the bandit school and liquidated the gang Lesovoy. 77 bandits were killed, two machine guns, one mortar, 18 rifles, seven automatic rifles and 5,800 rounds of ammunition were picked up. Remained the main bandit group, concentrated in the Black Forest. According to our intelligence, the bandits had all kinds of small arms, as well as mortars. In the gang was a significant number of soldiers and officers from the defeated German units. The total number of the formation reached several thousand people. In the liquidation of the gang, in addition to our regiment participated 90th Frontier Regiment, 112th separate manoeuvring group of troops, as well as attached to help us 318th Entry Division and front courses of political staff, the regiment went to the area of the village of Patsikov, in the direction of Stanislav. The head of the rear guard troops, Major General Fadiv, reported to the military council of the 4th Ukrainian Front. Pursuant to the order of 17.8.44, to clarify the location and liquidation of counter-revolutionary groups of the UN operating in the area of the Black Forest, I gave the order to the 92nd Red Banner Frontier Regiment to concentrate in the village of Patsikov by 12.0018.8.44 and at 16.0018.8.44 to proceed to the liquidation of the bandit group. 
I will report the result of the operation. Oh, at the village of Maiden, our battalion took the initial line. The combing of the forest began. Senior Lieutenant Pavel Glaviznin, who was next to me, noticed. What a forest. It was really black. The day is sunny, there is not a cloud in the sky, but here it is dark, as if in twilight. And the fir trees are like ours in Siberia, and silence, as if in the taiga. Look, Pavel, as if this taiga silence wouldn't be bad for us, Captain Ilya Vasilchenko said. A muffled groan was heard ahead and to the right. Something noisily skipped past through the shrubbery. Head of the outpost, Okrimchuk reported. In a dense spruce forest, a goat had struck Private Cyplinkov in the stomach. And it was quiet again, as if everything had died out. For about two hours, the battalion was combing the forest, but except for a few frightened goats, we found nothing. The forest was silent. Here is the first equalizing boundary a clearing. One by one, the battalion outposts came out to it. And then Lieutenant Gubar and Sergeant Shkuro brought two detainees. They were dressed in galafies, dirty green gymnasiums made of ragged cloth, pilots, with homemade knapsacks thrown over their shoulders. Comrade Captain, we were detained with a hand machine gun. How did you manage to do it? They probably warmed up in the sun, dozed off, and we covered them. Who are they? I asked the detainees. Why in the woods? Where did the machine gun come from? They don't say a word, as if they had water in their mouths. There's no time to question them. Our movement is accurately calculated by place and time. I reported the detainees to regimental headquarters and that they didn't answer questions. But it was already clear that these men were from the watch guard. We should wait for a quick meeting with the main forces. And so it happened. Ahead of them there was shooting. Then machine guns rattled to the left on the section of the neighbouring battalion. The forest was filled with the crackle of bursts and rifle shots. General Fedev reported to the Military Council of the 4th Ukrainian Front the reconnaissance of 18.8.44, in the area of Novaya Guta, Ribno, Maidan, Palok, Zavuj, Yavarov, revealed a band group of 250 men. On the night of August 18th to 19th, 100 political cadets of the front courses set up roadblocks on the likely ways of bandits' exit from the forest to the villages. The forces of the 92nd Red Banner Frontier Regiment made a sweep, as a result of which 187 bandits were detained, three were killed, and one was wounded. Among the detained two couriers from the district wire to the village one, four copies of typewritten orders and intelligence information were seized. Continuing the operation of combing the Black Forest, the 92nd Red Banner Frontier Regiment and front courses of political staff had two combat clashes with bandit groups. As a result of the battle, 27 bandits were killed, 77 bandits were captured, machine guns two, rifles two, pistols two, grenades seven, Ammunition 540. Our losses 92nd KPPP killed one. Courses of political staff killed two. The operation continued. While combing the Black Forest, we came across the camp of the Unofsi. There was a firefight. Machine guns and automatic rifles were beating deafeningly in front. The forest echo multiplied the cues, so that it seemed that every tree was firing. At first it was difficult to determine where the nationalists' firing positions were. Then, looking closer, we saw that they had hidden with German machine guns behind thick trunks of beech trees. Because of such hiding places it is not easy to knock them out. We had to pull up a platoon of anti-tank guns. One by one the machine guns fell silent. Having overcome the forest rubble, the border guards rushed into the bandit camp. Seeing the fighters, this motley clad crowd of people, shooting indiscriminately, rushed to escape. Among the bandits flashed figures dressed in the uniform of German soldiers and officers, among them someone in black as a uniform. In the forest it is difficult to catch up with the bandits. The gang managed to move away. We came to the edge of the forest. The bright rays of the sun hit our eyes. Here began the small woods, cut by ravines, streams, ravines. Senior Lieutenants Okremchuk and Dudarenko with their men examined the bushes and ravines. They found a large number of German mines. The approaches to the camp turned out to be mined. 
We had to move with precautions. First went Sergeant Shkuro with four-legged helpers. No, they were not sheepdogs, so familiar on the border. The mines were found by small mongrel dogs, trained in this business. Suddenly the sergeant shouted, Stop, I'll shoot. A shot rang out. Dudarenko reported that they had detained a bandit and killed another. What were they doing here? Suddenly one of the dogs, small, yellow, squealing, jumped to the steep bank of the stream and began to scratch the turf with his paws. Shkuro hurried to the dog's aid and turned away a layer of cut earth. A wooden door appeared. Having thrown the cat on it, the sergeant tore the door on himself. The mongrel rushed into the opened passage. In the cache turned out to be a gangster's warehouse. General Fadiv reported to the Military Council of the Front as of 24 point, double zero on August 26, 1944, the 92nd checkpoint, continuing the sweep of the Black Forest, found a warehouse with weapons and ammunition. The bandits guarding the warehouse were killed one, captured one, machine guns five, spare barrels two, ammunition magazines 19, rifles seven, grenades ammunition one five, triple zero were found in the warehouse. The operation to liquidate the gang Gamalia in the Black Forest continues. On August 28th, late in the evening our battalion went to the next frontier in the village of Bogorochny. It was quiet, windless. We were going uphill along the country road. Then the ascent ended. The battalion came to a gentle plateau. The moon rose. It illuminated everything around with a greenish ghostly light. Ahead, where the plateau ended, huge beaches could be seen. Dusky shadows fell from their dense crowns. Suddenly Sergeant Shkuro touched my sleeve and whispered. Comrade Captain, look, over there at that extreme beach something white. I looked closely and saw two white spots near the road, near which the beaches were standing. I signalled the battalion to stop. Captain Vasilchenko and a group of soldiers stealthily approached the trees, heard a slight noise. Then two green flashes of an electric flashlight, the signal everything is in order. On the ground lay two bound men in rawhide posts. Sergeant Shkuro held two German rifles. It turned out that the fighters seized the unknown men asleep. From what village? I asked the detainees. From Bogorodchini, they answered. What were you doing here? Don't you have a house? Are you sleeping in the forest under beeches? No, comrades, our cow is gone. We searched all day, got lost, went to rest and fell asleep. What are the rifles for? Where did you get them? We found them in the forest. We were afraid of the beast, so it wouldn't attack us at night. Do you know how to shoot? No, comrade. Then why do you need rifles if you can't shoot? We'd break the clubs. They fooled us for some time. Then the older one confessed that they were sentries from a bandit guard. Having clarified the location of the guardhouse, we decided to disarm it. A group of border guards led by Sergeant Shkuro crawled to the trench where the bandits were resting. Everything went off without a hitch. The guard of eight men was disarmed. The next morning we found ourselves at the height marked 403, and then we were shelled from the village. Bandit machine gunners were shooting from the attics of houses and from the bell tower on the church. But these were their last shots. The outcome of this battle is well stated in the report in addition to no. 10 384ths from 29.8.44 August 29th, units of the 92nd KPP and front courses of political staff continued the battle with the surrounded gang Gamalia. By the end of the day the gang was completely liquidated. As a result of the battle 166 bandits were killed, 19 of them Germans, 88 bandits were captured. We seized weapons. Machine guns 2, mortars 1, rifles 18, automatic rifles 7, grenades 77, ammunition 53, triple zero. In addition, during the battle destroyed machine guns 6, rifles 37, automatic rifles 12. Our losses 92 checkpoints killed 1, wounded 2. The chief of rear guard of the 4th Ukrainian Front, Major General Fedev. That's how our battalion, other units of the 92nd Regiment, courses of political staff acted in the Black Forest. It was similar in other areas where the 90th Border Regiment, 
112th Maneuver Group, and 318th Rifle Division were located. At this time, operations to eliminate nationalist gangs were also carried out in the rear of the 1st Ukrainian, 2nd Belarusian, 2nd Baltic, and a number of other fronts. They involved border units guarding the rear of the active armies and border guard detachments, which by that time had come to protect the state border, and were assisted by Red Army units. As a result, the bandit formations in the rear of the fronts were dealt a serious blow. This forced the Aun to go deep underground, and for some time to stop active actions. The measures taken to cleanse the rear of the fronts from gangs of nationalists and other counter-revolutionary rabble, the strengthening of agitation and propaganda work among the population noticeably changed the situation in the liberated areas. Young people of Russian and Ukrainian nationalities, with a huge upsurge in enthusiasm, go voluntarily into the ranks of the Red Army, says the report on the combat activity of troops to protect the rear of the 4th Ukrainian Front. Thus, the for the first three days more than 5,000 volunteers were enrolled and accepted into the Red Army, and by now the number of volunteers exceeds 20,000 people. The population of the villages provides great help in tidying up the highways, building bridges, restoring the railroad, the telegraph telephone network. For example, the population of the village of Poliana restored two bridges in one night, thus ensuring the timely transfer of equipment and ammunition for the successfully advancing Red Army units. Many of those who made up the bandit formations or supported them realised the futility of further fighting. An intercepted report of one of the Unov leaders, nicknamed Berian, stated the entire population is in a state of collapse. Most people do not believe in our victory. Talks are going around among people that there used to be bushes, hundreds, and now everything is gone. Everyone has been defeated. It will be like that all over Ukraine, no hundreds, no bushes, and where men are left, they agree to go to the Red Army, which harms our work. The attitude of the population has changed a lot compared to a month ago. Now they don't want to accept at all, and for apartments. Of course, it was not yet a complete victory. But it became easier to breathe in the frontline rear. Having completed the operation in the Black Forest, we moved to the front line. Our regiment was getting closer and closer to the frontier, where on June 22, 1941, the 94th Frontier Detachment met the beginning of the Great Patriotic War. Somewhere along the way, one September day, the battalion headquarters received an orientation note that reported an anti-fascist uprising in Slovakia. As stated in the received document, the rebels were supported by Slovakian troops, Soviet and Czechoslovak partisans, and soon the 4th Ukrainian Front began an operation to break through into Slovakia, which was named Carpathian Duklinskia. The deputy battalion commander on political part, Captain Evsenko, held a political briefing with the border guards, which ended with the words, The fascist invaders were dealt another blow. Slovaks rose up against fascism, and by this also brought its end closer. Together with our Slavic brothers in the ranks of the rebels' Soviet partisans, warriors. Soviet troops are moving to help the Slovaks. We too can help the rebels. For this purpose, it is necessary to fulfill even more selflessly the tasks entrusted to us to fight against the agents and accomplices of the enemy, to pull the enemy out of any crevices, to beat him everywhere. None of us, of course, did not know at that time that in the very centre of the uprising fearlessly acts under the name of Belov, the head of the Special Department of the 94th Border Guard Detachment Major D. Kovalenko. Major A. D. Kovalenko's way to Slovakia was long. He left the border together with the group of Major F. I. Vroblovsky. In Proskorov, he received a telegram with the order to arrive in Kiev and soon began to fulfill the duties of the head of the Special Department of the Ukrainian Border District. When Kiev was surrendered, he came out of the encirclement together with the headquarters of the Southwestern Front. And then he began to prepare for throwing out to the rear of the enemy. He was first near Rivni, in the Sarnensky forests, near the detachment of Colonel Medvedev, and then in the Tsimansky forests of Volyn region. So until January 1944. Then he found himself in Poland. From there he got to Slovakia shortly before the beginning of the Slovak national uprising. On the night of August 1, 1944, wrote to me after the war A.D. Kovalenko, I with a detachment crossed the Czechoslovak border, and the defence line of the Slovak army, 
which passed along the Beskidski ridge of the Carpathian Mountains. I acted in Slovakia for eight months. In addition to combat and sabotage operations against Hitler's occupants, he helped the rebellious Slovak troops. He joined the Red Army at the end of February, 1945. A. D. Kovalenko returned to Moscow in the first days of April 1945. For the heroism shown during the mission, he was awarded by the Czechoslovak government with two orders and two medals, as well as the Polish order. The inhabitants of the Lendak settlement of Poprad district in Czechoslovakia elected him an honorary citizen. In the book Soviet People in the European Resistance. There are lines about Anatoly Dmitrievich Kovalenko on August 1st. The advanced groups of the detachment under the command of Anatoly Kovalenko and Andrei Zolka entered the territory of Slovakia and established communication with the commander of the Slovak regiment Colonel Gusar and the secretary of the local HRC organization, Ivan Gakusha. In the first half of August 1944, partisans and local anti-fascists committed several sabotages on railroads. The head of the special department of the 94th Border Guard unit performed many military feats behind enemy lines during the Slovak national uprising. So the assistance to this uprising from the border guards of our detachment was also direct. But at that time, none of us knew anything about it and we followed almost the same roads as our battle comrade Major A. D. Kovalenko. We almost repeated his route, and it was no accident. We went the same place where we left in the summer of 1941, because that was the order. The chiefs of the border outposts of the western border, those of them who were not killed in the fighting, had to pass along the way of withdrawal again to meet the people who were left to fight behind enemy lines. These people helped Major A. D. Kovalenko to successfully complete the task. They also helped us to fight with the enemy agents settled in the areas liberated by the Red Army. One day the battalion through mountainous forest paths came to the rock road near the village of Visotsko Nishni, located on the site of our pre-war third commandant's office. Even earlier I managed to get in touch with Mikhail Osovsky, who is described in the beginning of the book. So, Having received the news, he tracked me down, and now we were going together through the passes, which Osovsky knew like the back of his hand. The battalion moved with the rear units of the 24th Division of the 18th Army, which was advancing in this direction. It was a curious sight. In the conditions of the Carpathian Mountains, the rear of our armies used not only horses, but also camels and donkeys for transportation of food and ammunition. Ishaks usually carried thermoses with food and water, and camels carried barrels and base plates of heavy mortars, boxes with mines, ammunition and grenades. Many Hutzels saw representatives of the southern fauna for the first time and looked at the strange animals with curiosity. And those with long necks arched, easily carrying huge packs, calmly looked at their surroundings. At first Osovsky, too, looked with undisguised curiosity at this army, which seemed to have descended from a fairy tale picture. Then he said jokingly, it seems that Hitlerites are ticking so fast because they are afraid of these long-legged, hunchbacked giants. We laughed. Of course, camels had nothing to do with it. The animals only facilitated the soldiers' labour. The Nazis were fleeing for other reasons. We weren't the same as we were in June 1941. And they weren't the same. Power was now on our side. And this force carried just retribution to the fascist monster, it seemed that there would be no end to the columns of our tanks, self-propelled guns, tractors pulling the cannons, Katyusha calculations, thousands of machine gunners, riflemen, armoured gunners, who filled the surrounding hollows, groves, the nearest villages. With excitement I approached with my battalion to the place Smoshe, where the headquarters of our third commandant's office used to be. Here is a pine grove. But the building of the commandant's office is gone. It's burned down but the houses of the reserve outpost commanded by Lieutenant Titkov remained. I looked at familiar houses and streets. Smoshe village had changed during these three years. The seal of desolation lay on everything. The yards were overgrown with weeds. The cobblestone sidewalk was scratched and broken. Numerous bridges over the Smozhanka River were crushed and crumpled, before it was a very cheerful village, but now it met us warily. Fear lurked in people's eyes. The time of fascist occupation had not passed without a trace, and the terror of bandits stopped some people from the natural desire to smile, 
to rejoice at the arrival of the Red Army. And yet our enemies did not manage to break, to destroy all those good sprouts that appeared in the life of a Hutzel peasant with the arrival of Soviet power in the Carpathian region. No sooner had we settled down in Smosha for a rest than the news that the Soviet border guards had returned to the village spread throughout the surrounding villages. People came to Smosha. Many recognised me. After all, I often had to come to the Commandant's headquarters on various occasions. There was no end to conversations, inquiries where is Commandant Shabakov now? What happened to Captain Gladkick? Where is he? And how did they fight? Did they come for good? Then they told how they lived in the occupation, who behaved how, what prevents them from establishing a normal life now. Smojans helped us to establish the location of one gang. We reported about it to the regiment headquarters. The gang was liquidated. The enemy tried hard to hold back the onslaught of the Soviet units. We had to beat him out of the last border villages. The area of the former 10th outpost also became a battle arena. The 168th Rifle Regiment of the 24th Rifle Division operated here, our defensive area, which was created on the site of the outpost before the war, came in handy. On September 30th, one of the battalions of the 168th Regiment, which occupied it, repulsed six enemy counterattacks from the area of the village of Latorki. The days of stay of Hitlerites on our land in Prakarpatia were numbered, as now I remember the morning when our troops crossed the line of the former state border. Katyusha turned their guides to the west. The barrels of hundreds of guns and mortars, which stood along the rocket road, looked the same way. The sky began to glow. The pink glare lay on the top of Mount Pikui. Hutzels came out of their houses. They watched with interest the skillful and well-coordinated actions of our artillery and mortar units. Then they climbed on the roofs of the houses to see the artillery preparation better. And then the guns rang out. Rocket shells burst in tongues of flame. After a powerful artillery preparation, the Soviet troops crossed the border. Our battalion entered the section of the 10th outpost. How much we waited for this minute. How many trials each of us, border guards, went through to see again the state border left in the summer of 1941. The feeling with which I entered the section of my outpost is incomparable. I, the former chief of the 10th outpost, was the only one who returned here in September 1944. The war scattered, scattered the soldiers of the outpost. I and many of them were no longer alive. Sixty-three people left the border with me. I came back alone. Of course, many fought on other parts of the huge Soviet-German front and entered the state border in other places but only I got to my outpost out of its former soldiers and commanders. When the battalion was in Krivka, the soldiers were immediately surrounded by the inhabitants. Despite the early hour, the whole village came out into the street. Seeing the frontier caps, villagers asked if any of their old friends, who before the war served at the 10th outpost, and suddenly they saw me. Alive, comrade chief. A rally was held all by itself. Lieutenant Nikolai Ivlev, the battalion's partog, went up to the porch of the former village council and told how the border guards of the 10th outpost and the battalion fought with the Nazi invaders, asked those gathered to help restore bridges and roads destroyed by the enemy so that the Red Army could smash the enemy more successfully. Ivan Melniki, a resident of the village with whom we worked well before the war, who remained a patriot during the hard days for the motherland, also spoke. Dear citizens of the village, he said, remember all these black years of Hitler's occupation I constantly told you do not believe the Germans, do not listen to the Anavsi, all the same the comrades will win, they will defeat the fascists and return to our village. Comrades from the outpost will come here too. You see, that's how it turned out. I had to say a few words. After the rally, no one wanted to leave. Residents surrounded the soldiers, questioned them, asked whether we would go further or stay on the border. We need to finish off the fascists, the soldiers said, to reach Berlin, and others will come here to the border. The twilight approached imperceptibly. The mountains and forests were covered with black haze. Accustomed for many years of life near the border to the observance of the border regime, the citizens of Crivy went home. 
We learned that the building of the 10th outpost had been destroyed during the fighting by artillery and mortar fire. The soldiers settled in an empty school, and the battalion headquarters in the house next door. Three residents of Krivka, three Ivans Ivan Melniki, Ivan Klipnik, and Ivan Polupan, my pre-war acquaintances, came to talk to me, to remember the pre-war years, everything that bound us together. Do you remember they said how we cut a clearing in the forest, how we installed wire fences, how we harrowed the control and trace strip, how we brought telephone poles? Then we began to ask about the soldiers of the outpost, about those whom we knew particularly well, about their fate. I told them how political officer Sklaya, petty officer Vershinin, Sergeant Belyayev and many others had died. Yes, they were good boys, sighed Ivan Klipnik. When we went to school to watch movies, Sergeant Belyayev always played the accordion. I remember in March 1941 at night, I was raised by Vershinin and Belyayev. Hurry up. They said, harness the horses, let's go to the border. Then with political officer Sklaya we carried a wounded intruder on a sledge. He, your politruk, was very dear to the people of our village. How well he then told us about life in the Soviet Union, about what was done in other countries. Klipnik also remembered two brothers who served at the outpost and often spoke to the villagers. Brothers Hretanin, I prompted. Yes, Hretanina, confirmed Klipnik. Gradually our conversation turned to how the Krivkas lived under the Germans who fought with them and who served them. It turned out that all residents of Krivka endured Hitler's occupation. None of them succumbed to hostile agitation, did not join the ranks of fascist lackeys or bandits. Ours, Tuzmievsky and Bermilo even paid with their lives for the fact that they refused to cooperate with the Banderites, did not go to the gang. Many Krivians helped the partisans, especially when Kovpak raided the Carpathians, assisted Soviet parachutists and scouts. Once parachutists appeared in our area, Ivan Polupan said, so we supplied them with food and gave them a guide. I recognised one of them. He served at your outpost. When was that? Ma, and in the 43rd year. And who, do you remember his last name? No, I didn't know his last name. But no matter how hard I strained my memory, I couldn't remember the fighter by the signs Ivan Polupan had mentioned. More than once our parachutists were thrown into this area, and each time they found shelter with the villagers. But in Bitler, Ivan Melniki noticed the Germans built one house. Who? Did you know Rezak? What do you, Ivan Witkula, comrade chief, to know about Rezak? Klipnik intervened. Rezak went behind the cordon back in 1939, as the border guards arrived at the border with Lieutenant Pozarski. I only smiled. About this master spy, more than once tried to break through the border, was well known to me. It was he who led the Onofsi abroad in April 1941 to form the 1st Battalion of the SS Division Galicia, came in contact with the bandit leaders. But I did not dissuade my interlocutors, but asked. And how does Rezak live in the house that the Germans built for him? Comrade Chief, the Germans built him a house back in 1942. But he was rarely there. He always disappeared somewhere. And when he showed up, it was only for a short time. Where is he now? When the Red Army took Boringa, Melniki said, Rezak disappeared again. Maybe he went into the gangs? I clarified. No, he didn't seem to be involved with bandits. The bandit leaders were afraid of him for some reason. Long after midnight, I said goodbye to my comrades from before the war. Only they left, as the sentry at the headquarters detained a man who urgently requested a meeting with the commander. He was let through to me. A guy of about 24 years old entered the room, dressed, like all Hutzels, in homespun pants, a hat and wooden pads bashmax. He timidly sat down on the offered chair, and taking off his hat, said, I have learned that border guards have appeared in the village of Krivka, and I have come to complain to you. Who and about what do you want to complain? The boy twirled his wide-brimmed hat, looked at his worn-out shoes at me and then spoke, not very decisively. Here's the thing. I know a girl whom I love very much, but in 1942, 
A man named Rezak came back from the cordon and simply took the girl away from me, threatening her. He said that if she did not meet him, he would kill her parents and me. Rezak hardly ever lives in his house. But when he does, he sends his buddies to pick her up. And today they took her away. Well, I said, that's interesting. Do you know where your girl went? I don't know exactly. But they went to a farm between the villages of Husny and Vysotsky. There are a few houses in a hollow and a small forest nearby. So should we look for your girl in the farm or in the woods? I don't know the boy shrugged his shoulders, looking at me hopefully. I called the duty officer and asked him to show the unexpected guest where he could wait and invited the deputy captain Vasilchenko and told him everything. It is necessary to check the guy's information. With lieutenants, Zastrazhin and Chaika and five machine gunners go with him to the girl's mother and find out whether the daughter is at home or not. Maybe the mother knows about Rizak. Then ask the boy to lead you to the farm. In the meantime, we'll comb the forest and block the farm. With his group, Captain Vasilchenko went to the girl's house, and I stealthily led two outposts to the intended area. The night was cold, foggy, as usually happens in the Carpathians in October. In the lowlands, in three steps, nothing could be seen. But on familiar paths, we came to the farm exactly. The chief of one of the outposts, Senior Lieutenant Okrimchuk, put up a barrier at the edge of the grove. Lieutenant Larchenko's outpost cordoned off the farm. They waited for the dawn to break. As soon as the sky turned pink in the east and a white shroud of fog became visible in the lowlands, we combed the grove. We found no one and nothing in it. Then the fog cleared, and in a deep mountain gully we saw several huts. This was the farm about which the night visitor had spoken. Leaving the barriers in place, I ordered to examine the first two houses. Suddenly a girl appeared in the street, but no one noticed where she came from. She looked like the one the young man described to us. The stranger was detained. I asked her, Where are you going so early? I was at a friend's house, the girl replied. I stayed with her for a long time and spent the night. My mum is home alone, worried about me, so I'm running early. And in which house did you spend the night? She showed me. The owner of the house and his daughter confirmed that the girl had indeed spent the night there. At that time Captain Vasilchenko appeared with his group, and the young man who told us about Rezak confirmed that it was her, his Kohana. The border guards went house by house around the farm, but found nothing. They had already checked the sixth house. The last one was inspected by Sergeant Kuznetsov and Private Murashkin. The owner assured that there was no one in his house, and he had not seen any strangers in the farm either. Doubts arose as to the truthfulness of the information received from the unlucky lover, and we were about to take out ambushes around the farm, as from the attic of the last house came the voice of one of the border guards. Come out or we'll shoot. Through specially made loopholes in the roof of the house the bandits opened heavy fire. Rifle shots rang out. Murushkin was wounded. Kuznetsov carefully lowered him down from the attic, and the border guards pressed against the wall. Sergeant San Instructor Statsenko appeared. The bandits wounded him too. A stray bullet hit my horse in the chest. I had to lie down. The firefight continued. Bandits responded to the offer to surrender with fire. It became clear we can't take them alive. Then the thatched roof of the house caught fire. The bandits descended into the rooms. Then they threw a smoke bomb and some grenades outside the door. Under the cover of the smoke screen, three of them jumped out into the street, while the others kept shooting back. These three ran straight at Sergeant Alexandrov and me. We were prevented from shooting at the bandits by a ledge of the bank cliff. Nevertheless, Alexandrov gave a machine gun burst. Bandits threw a grenade in response. Small shrapnel cut the sergeant's skin in several places on his forehead, and the earth covered his eyes. I grabbed his machine gun. At the same time I heard Lieutenant Gubar's command. Fire on the bandits. Two were mowed down at once, and the third jumped over me and Alexandrov to the opposite bank of the stream and fell. I turn around. The bandit is shooting at me. I feel the bullet passing between my overcoat and tunic. 
I pull the trigger. The line goes off. The man who shot me lies motionless. I get up. I go to him. A tall brute in a half-military uniform clutched a German rifle in his hand. Captain Vasilchenko came up, looked at the dead man. This is Razak. I answered. Yes, judging by the description, it is indeed Rezak, but to be sure let others identify him. A young man and a girl recognised Rezak. The villagers who knew the bandit also confirmed it. We drew up a report. Then I ordered to dig a grave. The Krivchans buried these and those bandits whom we destroyed in the house, saying death to the dog is the dog's death. The story about the ignominious end of the one who, before the war, was operating on the Soviet border, performing the task of Hitler's intelligence, and now continued to serve her, can be finished with an excerpt from the archive file 15.10. 1944, these six and seven outposts of the 2nd Battalion in the area of the farm near the village Vysotskoye liquidated the reconnaissance and sabotage group of 12 people, led by the pre-war German agent Rizak. In the same days, another pre-war spy Bugaychik fell into our hands. With the arrival of border guards in Krivka, Bugaychik tried to hide in the village of Bitlia, where the 293rd Reserve Regiment was stationed. Local Hutzels were assigned to this regiment. So the spy expressed his desire to voluntarily go to serve in the Red Army. It was curious to look at Bugaychik when Lieutenant Palagin with two machine gunners brought him to me. I will tell you everything, Citizen Chief, he began at once. Bugaychik's story, as he told it, was as follows. In the fall of 1939, during a trip to the village of Visotsko Verkny, Bugaychik came to his acquaintance Mikhail Yark. They got to talking. Bugaychik asked, How will it be now under Soviet rule? Lyak replied that the Soviets would not last long here. And I was going to go to Poland, to the Germans, Bugaychik confessed his intentions. Yark became more frank. Why would you leave home for a foreign land? You can help the Germans here. Your village is near the border. When the Germans come, they won't forget you. Bugaychik agreed. Lyak gave him the nickname Golubchik and the task to stay in the village of Beitel. A contact named Kalinik would come to Bugaychik from Lark with packages, for which a man would then appear and call the conditional password, Do you have any clover for sale? to which Bugaychik would reply, I have already sold it. He should give the packages to the man who came, and those that the man would bring to Kalinik. During the war, Bugaychik performed tasks for the Nazis. But it is rightly said, no matter how much the rope is twisted, there will be an end. There came an end to Bugaychik's activities in favour of Hitler's intelligence. Once Captain Vasilchenko brought to Krivka a Jewish family, a husband and wife and two children. Here, he said, what happened? It turned out that the head of the family before the war was a teacher in the village of Beitel. There was a border outpost of our commandant's office there. At this outpost, Elia Vasilchenko served for some time as a political officer. With the school teacher, they were well acquainted. When the war broke out, the teacher's family could not evacuate. So for almost three years they hid in the forests. She was helped by two Hutzel families from Bittel and Husney. They supported her, provided her with clothes and food, and sheltered her in their homes for the winter. This is how the Jewish family endured the Nazi occupation. I did not manage to see the families of the patriots who, risking their lives and the lives of their children, saved the lives of Jewish children, their father and mother, I wanted so much to thank them for their patriotism and courage. We sent the teacher's family to the rear, and we said goodbye to the inhabitants of Krivka and went on. The troops of our front were successfully moving westward, liberating towns and villages of Transcarpathia. The battalion crossed the river Krivchanka and found itself in front of the top of the mountain Piki. It looks like we'll have to sweat a lot to get over this hill, said Senior Lieutenant Karnin. Is the height frightening? I asked and smiled, remembering how in 1940 to 1941 we were running day and night on alarm over these slopes. And I reassured Canin we won't go over the top. We'll go up a little and walk along, walk along the plateau to the border. Everything was almost the same as before. The mountains, the spruce forest, 
stone columns that marked the line of the state border. When I stopped the battalion, I said, Comrades, this is where our Soviet land ends. This is the former border. On the height with a clearing, which you can see from here, there was an outpost where I was the chief. Now the outpost is gone. It's been destroyed. But I and my comrades on the outpost have always remembered and will always remember it. Here we met the first morning of the war. From here we went deep into the country. Here we came back again. And what is the name of the height where your outpost stood? asked one of the soldiers. This height has no name, but its mark is 902 metres above sea level. Below was the land of the neighbouring country. The village of Latorka was visible. Having crossed the border line, the battalion descended into a gully. The building of the former enemy guardhouse was empty. Windows and doors were open. There was broken glass, scraps of paper, shell craters. How familiar everything was here. Everything looked exactly as our observers described it. Having crossed the river Latorica, we went further west. The party and the government highly appreciated the heroism of the Soviet soldiers who acted in Transcarpathia. On October 18th, the capital of our motherland Moscow saluted the troops of the 4th Ukrainian Front, who overcame the Carpathian Range for 275 kilometres. By the order of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, 40 formations and units of the 4th Ukrainian Front received the honorary name of Carpathian. At the end of October 1944, we learned that our 92nd Frontier Red Banner Regiment received the honorary name of Carpathian. The 18th Army moved forward and by the end of October 25th captured the towns of Perechin and Mukachev. Perechin was especially well remembered because I had an unexpected meeting with a former border guard of the 10th outpost, Makarov. On the approach to Perechin, the battalion set up a checkpoint. Here Makarov, who served in the 24th Division, arrived with some cargo. Seeing the border guards, he asked just in case from the senior guard. Who is your battalion commander? Captain Pajev, answered the senior officer. What Pajev? Not the one who was the chief of the outpost in Krivka? The same one. Makarov rushed to look for me. We met. I wanted to keep a combat soldier in the battalion, but Makarov had urgent business. And then our roads diverged and never came together again. I don't know where Makarov is now, how his life turned out. From Makarov, I learned about the fate of another border guard of the 10th outpost Borisov, whom I had a chance to see after the war. Makarov confirmed that he saw how Petty Officer Vershinin was killed in the battle near Oboyenu. We stayed several days in Perechin and Mukachev. In Mukachev we visited the buildings of the Gestapo and one of the intelligence schools. There is no more the shadow of the Gestapo over Mukachev, over other towns and villages of Transcarpathia. The dark night of fascist captivity is behind us. The words of the national hero of Transcarpathia Hero of the Soviet Union Oleksa Borkanyuk, whose life was cut short in the Hungarian prison Margit Kerut, became true. I go to death bravely, courageously, the way people of our type should. I have lived for 41 years, of which I have devoted 20 to the cause of the poor people. All my life I have been an honest, loyal, tireless fighter without personal gain. And so I die, because I know that our cause is just, and the victory will be ours. A completely different life came to Transcarpathia with the Soviet power. Many years later I visited these places again. How everything had changed here. I went to my Krivka again. It was already night. But the village was met with a sea of electric lights. Every house was illuminated with light. And in the morning I could not believe my eyes no one eyed, shabby shriveled huts, no patchwork plots of land. I met again with my old acquaintance Ivan Polupan. He told me that in Krivka, there is now a rich cattle breeding collective farm. People live happily and prosperously. We climbed with Ivan to the height of 902 metres. Time has done its work. Overgrown with grass and spruce trees is the place where once there was our outpost and fierce battles were fought. Latorka village has also changed. New houses, bright roofs. Only the tops of the mountains Veliki Verk, Piku Yabornik, Blizhnei, Magura have not been touched by time. They were the same as in 1941, as in November 1944,
when we came to them to provide passes for our advancing troops, before the Soviets lay Europe, which was waiting to be liberated. After the war, writers and poets of all peoples of the European countries liberated by the Red Army wrote many stirring, grateful words about the Soviet soldier, expressed great gratitude to the Soviet soldier for his selfless international feat. And for them it was not important whether the Soviet soldier was a tanker or an infantryman, an artilleryman or a sapper, a signalman or a pilot. Soviet soldiers of different types and branches of troops were for the liberated peoples all united. But for us it still has some significance. No one is forgotten and nothing is forgotten, these are not general, but very specific words. It means that not a single feat, not a single event of the past war has been forgotten. But I have not yet met a book that would tell about the participation of border guards in the liberation mission in the countries of Europe. Only the collection of documents border troops during the Great Patriotic War, 1941 to 1945, published in 1968, somewhat fills this gap. There are documents that tell about the participation of border troops in the liberation of Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia. However, the book does not contain information about the participation of border guards in the liberation of Czechoslovakia. Not all documents, apparently, still found. But the first word is said. Said that the border guards took the city of Ackermann, participated in the storming of Berlin, in the elimination of the encircled fascist group in Budapest, and even captured the commander of the Budapest group of Colonel General P. Wildenbruch. It tells about the border guards who fought in the ranks of the European resistance movement. And of course it is told about how fighters in green caps fought with various anti-people fascist organisations and armed formations, enemy agents, various gangs. What did the border guards who marched with the advancing units of the Red Army encountered in the liberated countries? as a result of a long stay under occupation on this territory, says the document on the combat actions of the frontier units during the liberation of Poland, there remained a widely developed network of agents of the enemy's intelligence agencies, proxies, collaborators of the enemy, and other hostile elements. In addition, after entering the territory of Poland, Polish nationalists, supporters of the emigrant Polish government, showed their illegal activities in the rear of the front. In addition, the enemy's intelligence agencies threw their agents into the rear of our front by throwing them out of airplanes by parachute. A characteristic phenomenon on the second Belarusian front was that in the rear of the advanced units of the Red Army was a significant number of surrounded enemy, soldiers and officers. Our troops had to fight with scattered small groups. Here is an excerpt from a document about the combat activity of the border units in Hungary since the transfer of hostilities to the territory of Hungary the Hungarian fascist party Nilos Kyristis began to carry out active activities in the rear of the front, which began to organise subversive terrorist groups of former soldiers and officers of the Hungarian army and other fascist elements. The sabotage terrorist groups left behind the front were supplied by the German command with weapons, ammunition, explosives and concealed in deep forests. After a short training, these sabotage groups were to deploy their activities on the communications of the Red Army units, Something similar was also on the territory of Czechoslovakia, where in November 1944 troops of the 18th Army of the 4th Ukrainian Front entered. Due to the rapid advance of the army units in the mountains and forests, there were numerous small groups of enemy soldiers and officers, which we had to catch, often engaging them in combat. We also detected sabotage groups of the enemy, neutralised Hitler's agents, Vlasovites and bandits of Kaminsky. Fascist intelligence was throwing its last cadres into action. It disbanded intelligence schools, creating from the students sabotage groups that settled in the territory of Czechoslovakia and other countries liberated by the Red Army from the Nazi yoke. At the beginning of November 1944, a detachment consisting of Petty Officer Kaplan, Privates Penchok, Shilov and Gafarov, in the village of Malaya Berezna detained a man dressed in the uniform of a junior lieutenant of the Red Army who had inaccuracies in one of the documents. At the preliminary investigation, the detainee showed that he had been recruited by Hitler's intelligence in the Czechoslovak town of Kozis and was now sneaking across the front line. The spy was assigned the task to go to the front communications in the area of the village of Malaya Berezna to settle there, to establish surveillance of the movement of the headquarters of our units and to return after the completion of the task. 
The deputy commander of the 92nd Border Regiment, Captain Ignatov, interrogated the Hitler's agent. The minutes of this interrogation have been preserved, no matter how the detainee tried to defend himself, but he was exposed in more than one crime. It turned out that he was in a detachment of thugs, commanded by the traitor Kaminsky, made by Hitlerites in generals of SSS. At the end of 1942, or the beginning of 1943, in the village of Lokot, then in the Oral region, which was the centre of the administrative district created by the occupiers, the Hitler's intelligence agency Abbastel 107, a branch of the spy centre in Oral, settled down. Former civil engineer Bronislaw Kaminsky became the burgomaster of Lokot administrative district. At the behest of the Germans, Kaminsky organised the Russian National Labour Party, consisting of former criminals, police officers, headmen and other scum. This party aimed at overthrowing the Soviet power with the help of the Germans and establishing an independent national Russia. At the same time, Kaminsky participated in the formation of the so-called Russian Liberation Army. The hands of this enemy of the Soviet motherland were stained with the blood of hundreds and thousands of patriots. Bryansk forests, where many partisan detachments hid, were the main object of Kaminsky's punitive expeditions. Major General Abaizov, who commanded a combined detachment of border guards near Popolnaya, wrote in a report in 1943 in addition to abandoned and left to settle in the rear of the front agents of the enemy's intelligence agents' agencies. The territory liberated by the Red Army units from the occupants turned out to be heavily contaminated with agents of the enemy's counterintelligence and police agencies. The area of Bryansk forests, which was a powerful base of the partisan movement, was particularly exposed to the German intelligence agencies. In addition to the activities of Agent Nature in order to combat the guerrilla movement, the occupiers created special formations of the RAF units and police detachments of the People's Guard. The largest rower formation was a brigade headed by Oberbürgermeister Kaminsky, which was stationed in the territory of the Lukot administrative district of the Oral region. Kaminsky had long been sought by the Soviet Czechists. We, too, had received a corresponding instruction to that effect. Therefore Ignatov asked the agent detained by us. Where is Kaminsky now? I don't know exactly, but lately he has been in Poland. That was true. The Germans took Kaminsky's brigade to Poland and threw it along with their units to suppress the Warsaw Uprising. This they did for purely provocative purposes. It was profitable for Hitlerites to use Russians against Poles. Units of the brigade did not play the main role in pacifying the Warsaw Uprising. They fulfilled their provocative task by participating in the massacre. The interrogation lasted a long time. We received a lot of valuable information about other enemy agents who were trained in COSIS together with the detainee, about the place of their transfer, about their approximate tasks. But we never found out Kaminsky's whereabouts. Only after some time we learned that the Germans shot Kaminsky themselves. Thus ended the path of the former Oberbürgermeister, or rather, Obertraitor and Bandit. By the end of November 1944, the enemy did not expect that the wide swampy plain southwest of Yuzhgorod would become the scene of a fierce battle. Here the advanced units of the 24th Infantry Division were transferred to the right bank of the Ondava River by a railroad bridge. Some units forced the river with the help of improvised means. After capturing the bridgehead on the Ondava, the division in cooperation with other formations of the 18th Army began to develop the offensive on the town of Trebizo. The enemy offered weak resistance and retreated into the mountains. Pursuing him, our troops liberated the Czechoslovak town of Trebyshov on November 26, but in the mountains heavy fighting began. Our offensive was suspended. The troops of the 4th Ukrainian Front consolidated on the achieved borders and began to prepare for new offensive operations. Our battalion entered Trebizo shortly before the new year. The military commandant of the town informed us, when we were accommodated, that the leaders of Trebyshow had asked him to celebrate the new year with representatives of the Red Army units that had liberated the town. The meeting of the new year took place in the largest building. In the spacious hall there were tables covered with white tablecloths. In the centre was set decorated with toys Christmas tree. From the ceiling fell the bright light of electric lamps. Music was playing. The hand of the clock approached midnight. The secretary of the district committee of the CHRA woman invited everyone to take their seats. The music subsided. 
From the receiver came the voice of his native Moscow. The chime struck. The anthem of our motherland sounded. M.I. Cullinan spoke. And then the secretary of the district committee of the CHR and the chairman of the city government, also a woman, took the floor. They said a greeting in honour of our Soviet government, the Communist Party and the Soviet people, warmly thanked the representatives of the Red Army for the liberation from the fascist invaders. At that time I did not ask the names of these women, who, as I was told, bravely fought Hitler's invaders in partisan units. But many years later I received a letter from Czechoslovakia. It was written by the chairman of the City National Committee in Trebyshov Jan Chovanek we read in your book about the meeting of the New Year 1945 in our city, and that you do not remember the names of the women who took part in the celebrations. One of them was Rosa Zarembova, who unfortunately at died three years ago, and the second was Yolana Sachakova, who soon married Commander Kovalchuk and left for the Soviet Union with him. Now you would hardly recognize our city. In the years that have elapsed since the liberation, it has changed a lot. It is still changing now thanks to the great construction we are carrying out. We would be glad if you would come to visit us in Trebizo. And then we parted already at dawn. It was a quiet morning. The first day of January 1945, the last year of the bitter war. At six o'clock our guns began to speak. The troops of the 18th Army continued to advance in the direction of Kosis. In the first days of January, the regiment commander received an order by radio by decision of the Military Council of the Front. Your battalion was ordered to enter the city of Kosis with the advanced units of the army and ensure proper order. Contact the representative of the Front Headquarters, Colonel Viron. Until a special order, you will be under his command. The beginning of January 1945 in Slovakia was slushy, but in the mountains the frost reached 25 degrees Celsius. On the way to Kosis we had to overcome the Hedil mountain range. The only road on which all kinds of troops could move freely was along the bank of the Hornad River. It was impossible to leave it. The enemy mined the entire floodplain of the river very densely. On the road he built a lot of rubble. The road was under fire of enemy long-range artillery all the time. Nevertheless, following directly behind the combat orders of the advancing troops, we successfully completed most of the way. Only on the approach to Kossis there was a hitch. A bridge had been blown up. The sign arrow showed a detour to the right. We crossed the river, pulling our wagons and cars across it with great difficulty. The banks of the river were literally crushed by the tracks of the tanks and turned into a clay slurry. The same was the bypass road, a solid earthy mess, laid on virgin land along the river. Only in the evening we got to the stony shallow water, crossed the river again, and found ourselves on the highway. It was going uphill. This was the Kadil Ridge. At first the ascent seemed almost insensible. Then it became harder to walk. The wagons creaked heavily. The engines of the vehicles hummed with a tearing noise. It became cold. The road was covered with ice. The cars began to slip. It seemed that there was not much left to the pass, but it was still not there. Suddenly the head vehicle, on which the radio station was installed, stopped, although its engine was working at full power, and then slowly crawled back. Another one crawled after it. People got off the road. We watched in awe as our drivers showed composure and coolness, being literally on the verge of disaster, by some miracle drivers Novik and Antonov made it to the platform hollowed out in the mountain. Having come across piles of rubble and sand, the cars stopped. We breathed a sigh of relief. Lieutenant Burinov, commander of the battalion's communications platoon, and Captain Chukhanov jumped out of the cabs. Well, I thought we were dead, confessed Chukhanov. I watched Antonov turning the steering wheel and did not believe that everything would be all right. The motor was running, the speed was on, but the car was sliding like a sledding. Something had to be done. Chukhanov suggested to leave the cars, go on foot, and at dawn the drivers would try to overcome the rise. But this did not suit us. We could need the cars at any minute. And the ice on the road would not melt in the morning, unless there was more of it. Someone shined a flashlight on a pile of sand. What if we sprinkle sand on the road? Maybe cars could get through. Two wagons were freed, loaded with sand. 
the wagons moved forward. The battalion column moved after them. The soldiers sprinkled sand on the icy highway. They went on like that all night. We literally stormed the pass. We brought sand, sprinkled the highway, came back again for sand, put logs under the wheels of cars, again pulled uphill the wagons loaded with sand together with exhausted horses. The ordeal ended only in the morning. Having overcome the pass, the battalion descended to the plain. On January 19th, the advanced units of the 18th Army knocked out the enemy from Kossis and continued to push him to the west. Together with these units, our battalion entered Kossis. From the nearby heights, the Nazis were still shelling the city. The train station was burning. There were trains on the tracks, packed to the brim with furniture. It was as if the Nazis had brought here furniture from all the cities of Europe that they had looted. Colonel Viron, who entered the city with one of the units of the 18th Army, showed me an empty castle belonging to a Hungarian baron and ordered to place the border guards there. In the first hour of our stay in Kossis, we organised a commandant's service. We closed the entrances to and exits from the city with checkpoints, sent patrols to the streets, combed the nearest hollows and groves. On the day after the liberation of Kossis from the Nazis, all local government institutions worked normally in the town. Store owners opened trade. The streets of the town were being cleaned up. It became known that the Czechoslovak government was to arrive in Kossis. On the day of the government's arrival, we were in the central square. The head of the honor guard, a captain of the Czechoslovak army, gave a report to those who had arrived. Everyone went up to the balcony of one of the houses. The future chairman of the government, Czechoslovak ambassador to Moscow Z. Ferlinger made a brief speech to the audience. In the evening, the solemn meeting of the government continued in the city theater. The battalion was ordered to go north to the city of Presov and continue to guard the rear of the 18th Army. When we found ourselves in Presov, I remembered a large group of refugees from Presov, those very students who in 1940, fleeing from Hitler's new order, left their hometown and crossing the Soviet border, found themselves at the 10th outpost. From their stories, I remembered the town of Presov. The front command was regrouping its troops, parts of the 18th army and behind them and our regiment moved further and further to the northwest. At the end of February or the beginning of March, we crossed the Czechoslovak border in the area of Neuitarga Zekopane and found ourselves on the territory of Poland. Remembering how we were warmly welcomed in Czechoslovakia, we were surprised when, having entered Zekopane, we did not see a single living soul in the streets of this small town. It was as if an epidemic had swept through the town and everything had died out. After checking one of the empty buildings and making sure that it was not mined, we settled down in it. To maintain order in the city organised a patrol service. Soldiers and commanders of the Red Army, who entered Zekopane, flawlessly complied with the decree of the military council on the norms of behaviour of our soldiers on the territory of a foreign country. In the evening, two women came to our location. After shyly saying hello, they told us that they used to work for the owner of this building. I did not remember the names of the women. One of them was a native of the Polish city of Gdynia. I asked why there were no people to be seen in the town. The rich have fled, the women replied, but the working people are there, but they are hiding. Hiding from whom? I wondered. After all, there were no battles for your city. Who are your people afraid of? You know, the women confessed, the fascist radio day and night, shouted that the Russians were taking away everyone and taking them to Siberia. Our Polish collaborators were not lagging behind the Germans either. When the Red Army units approached, the Germans began to catch people and take them away with them. So the people hid. The next day the town gradually revived. Impeccable behaviour of our fighters convinced of the falsity of fascist propaganda. A whole delegation came to the border guards of the battalion. Several elderly men told us that in their town and in neighbouring Poronin lived Vladimir Lenin. All of them willingly undertook to show us historical places to lead us to Lenin's house. We were touched by the fact that Poles spoke about Lenin with such love and respect. Of course, we wanted very much to walk through those places where Vladimir Ilyich was once dear to all of us. But the front troops were continuously advancing. Being inseparably connected with them, we turned to the southwest. 
Once again we overcame the mountain range and entered the Czechoslovak land. Here for the first time we encountered a detachment of German Volkssturmist. Around the fall of 1944, the fascist leadership of Germany began to take extraordinary measures to increase the number of the German fascist armed forces and expand military production at any cost. On September 25, 1944, a decree was issued to create the so-called Volkssturm. The decree required all German men capable of bearing arms to join the struggle the Volkssturm mobilised the entire male population of the country between the ages of 16 and 60. These untrained and poorly armed units were sent to the front. From February 1945, in addition to the Volkssturm, so-called Niesenau battalions and Valkyrie units were created for the defence of settlements. We encountered one of these Volkssturm formations when we were again in Czechoslovakia, in the areas where the Sudeten Germans lived. Of course, the Volkssturmists did not offer us any serious resistance, although they tried to shoot from attics and cellars of houses. Border guards quickly fished out all of them, disarmed them and gathered them in the town square. They were mostly boys who looked at us with curiosity, waiting for the decision of their fate. But there were some who appeared annoyed at the failure. These looked angrily, like young wolves I would bite, but my teeth are weak. Having had a proper talk with the young Germans, and having warned them that in case of repetition of such behaviour they would be held responsible according to the laws of wartime, we let them go home. The leaders were taken to an empty house and interrogated. Having encountered the Volkssturm for the first time, we wanted to know what kind of formation it was. Were they bandits who had come from somewhere else? The battalion commander, a German in his thirties, a former SS man who had been wounded on the Eastern Front, declared that the Volkssturm was not a bandit, but a people's militia, despite the fact that his army turned out to be ineffective, he talked about how the people's militia would still play a role in the war. I think he himself did not believe it well, and spoke not so much for us, but for those who were under his command, and now were our prisoners, so that they did not doubt his loyalty to the Reich. We sent the Volkssturm commanders to the prisoner of war camp, and we ourselves were busy with other things. Soon a Czech citizen, about whom it was said that he had either served in the Gestapo or had been taken for something, and then released by the Nazis, was sitting in front of us. He was about forty years old and spoke Russian well, so we could not misunderstand or misinterpret him. A major assassination is being prepared in the Soviet Union, he said. At first we thought he was a little out of his mind, but his speech was coherent, his thoughts logical. He outlined in some detail the plan of preparation of an assassination attempt on one of the representatives of the Supreme Command Headquarters. We immediately reported the Czech citizen's message to the regimental headquarters. From there came Captain Ignatov. At first he was distrustful of our report, but after talking to the detainee, recorded his testimony and quickly went back. I do not know whom Captain Ignatov informed afterwards, but after the war one read how Soviet counterintelligence officers prevented a terrorist operation of the Nazi organ Zeppelin to destroy the leaders of the Supreme Command headquarters. All the details of the operation, which we reported on command from the Czech citizen story, coincided. From the town of Spiska Nova West the battalion was ordered to go to the area of the village of Smakovsi, and until the approach of our troops to ensure the safety of the Cheslovak resorts there, scattered on the forest slopes of the mountains. At the same time from the deputy head of counterintelligence of the front, Colonel Viren, we received information that the German command through the mountain ranges of the Tatras is preparing in this direction to throw into our rear a sabotage group of 20 to 30 people. This group, according to the available information, was to use the empty buildings of the resort on one of the highest mountains. Lieutenant Morkovkin's 7th outpost was sent to Smokovtsi. Together with Morkovkin went also the chief of staff of the battalion captain Vasily Anizimov and the battalion's partog Vladimir Belov. The soldiers deftly overcame snow-covered steeps, desperately stormed the two-kilometer height, although none of them had no mountaineering practice. The border guards were exhausted, but they reached the resort well in advance. In the morning they intercepted the saboteurs and in the ensuing battle completely destroyed them without losing a single man. A few days later we handed over the buildings of the resort to representatives of the headquarters of General Ludwig Svoboda. This episode was captured on film by frontline cameramen.
Moving across the Czechoslovak land behind the advancing troops, we liquidated enemy agents, thus weakening the activity of the anti-communist, counter-revolutionary underground that the fascists were trying to create in the country. One by one, two by two, or even in groups we caught Hitler's agents lurking in the rear of the Soviet troops. Border guards of the 7th outpost detained an unknown man in the uniform of a Red Army officer, armed with two Czechoslovak pistols, reads one of the archival documents. At the preliminary investigation, the detainee showed that he had studied at the School of Hitler's Military Intelligence Service, Abwehr. In connection with the successful advance of the Red Army, the leadership of the school from among the cadets' intelligence officers urgently created sabotage groups and began to throw them into the Soviet rear or leave them in villages and towns during the withdrawal of Hitler's troops. Such groups were left in the area of Radov and Novo Mesto. For search and detention of saboteurs in Novo Mesto, we sent a search group headed by Lieutenant Chaika, the head of the outpost senior Lieutenant Dudarenko, and his assistant Lieutenant Voronenko. With the help of local residents, Lieutenant Chaika established where the saboteurs Kravchek and Friedrich were hiding and detained them. They said that they studied in a sabotage school located in the tourist house to Hubeid, 10 kilometres east of Seitenberg, and then were thrown into the rear of the Red Army. The remaining members of this group were fished out near the villages of Jablunovo and Drevo Hostis. I can't help telling about one more detention of an enemy agent by the border guards of our regiment. I learned about it after the war from Captain Ignatov. It was in Poprad. Our troops had just liberated the city. The border guards entered after them. No sooner had we arrived, as they say, than we received a statement from a local resident that she had met a woman on the street who worked for the Gestapo in Prezov. How long ago did you see her? asked Ignatov. Zara Zaraz, replied the Slovak woman. Captain Ignatov asked her to describe the appearance and characteristics of the Gestapo officer in as much detail as possible. The border guards quickly sealed off all the exits from the city. The search began. On one of the outskirts of the city, the chief of the checkpoint was Sergeant Translators. A woman came up to him and, smiling, asked, Boys, help me get on a hitchhiker. And where are you going? The sergeant asked. To the village of Gabi. The woman held herself loosely, smiled playfully, but in her gaze cast on the deserted highway, the sergeant detected anxiety. Translator thought that the stranger looked like the one he had been informed about at the checkpoint. He looked at the woman carefully. What are you looking at? Or do you like me? The stranger became openly flirtatious. Come with me, the sergeant replied dryly. Where else? The woman jumped up, immediately changing her tone. To our unit. Are you crazy? I have to go, I'm already late. The interpreter took his automatic rifle and ordered. Go straight ahead. In the headquarters of the detachment, she presented a certificate in the name of Guzieva Zoya Sergeevna, who from January 24th to February 5th, 1945, was in the partisan detachment of Lieutenant Colonel Velichko. Is that all? Captain Ignatov asked the woman, what else could a partisan have? Indeed, what can have a partisan or a partisan whose detachment has just joined the Red Army units? But Ignatov decided not to hurry. A confrontation was made with the woman who described the Gestapo officer. The Slovakian confirmed her statement. Impersonating Guzaeva even tried to attack. This woman is confusing me with someone else. I have never met her. This is a provocation. Found more people who confirmed the statement of a local resident, and the detainee had to identify herself. It turned out that since April 1943 she was involved in the intelligence department of one of the German armies. At first she served as an interpreter in the SD prison in Drohobich and Elvov, and then she found herself in Katowice and Prezov, where from December 1944 she carried out the task of the SD chief to establish the location of the partisan detachment of Akhmatulin. She went around many mountain villages, but did not find a partisan detachment. But she found another guerrilla unit and reported it to the SD. What became of this partisan group? Asked Ignatov. 
This was not part of my functions. Probably in this area were sent to the SS troops. What else did you do on behalf of the SD? On the assignment of the head of the department, I visited several times the camps of Soviet prisoners of war, where I agitated the prisoners to serve in the so-called Russian Liberation Army of Vlasov and in the SS troops. Where did you last see the head of the department? In the town of Zelina. What did the department and you personally do in this town? I do not know what the members of the department did and what their fate was, because I was only in Zelin for two days. I was summoned by the head of the department and told to get ready quickly. We got into the car and drove out of town. He gave me an assignment under the guise of a Soviet parachutist to sneak into Lieutenant Colonel Velichko's detachment and find out some data. Since the headquarters of the partisan detachment where Guzieva was, according to my superior, was completely destroyed, I should not have feared witnesses. Gestapovka only partially completed the task. She managed to find the partisan detachment and even get a certificate that she stayed there for ten days, but all other plans remained unrealized. Border guards with the help of Slovak patriots neutralized the enemy agent. The troops of the 4th Ukrainian Front, in which the soldiers of the 1st Czechoslovak Army Corps fought, continued the offensive. The 1st and 2nd Ukrainian Fronts, which had entered Czechoslovakia, also acted successfully. By mid-April, after serious battles, important industrial centers of the country Ostrava and Bierno were liberated, with their offensive, the 4th and 2nd Ukrainian fronts bound the main forces of almost one million strong group of German armies centre, and did not allow Hitler's command to transfer reinforcements from here to Germany, to Berlin. This greatly facilitated the fight of our troops against the Berlin grouping of the enemy.